Hello, thank you for coming. Um, I'm doing my talk differently to how I've done it in the past. In the past, I've focused on explaining how the things I'm talking about were discovered. Um, I'm not doing that now. I'm going to talk just about the things that have been found. Um, explaining how I know this stuff just takes too long, um, and you can pursue that somewhere else. <clears throat> My main interest of research is this lady, Catherine Maltwood, um, a very unusual woman, ahead of her times. Uh, she died in 1961, um, but she was a leading occultist and uh, mystic of her day, involved with many people in the magical scene, occult scene, antiquarian scene. Um, her life was very strange. She traveled all over the world, um, Egypt, China. She was instrumental in bringing Zen Buddhism to the West. Uh, she was an artist, a uh, sculptress. She had her own studio in Kensington, London, and she was quite famous in her day. She's more famous now, or infamous, for the Glastonbury Zodiac. <clears throat> However, she never called it the Glastonbury Zodiac, and the Glastonbury Zodiac is a modern nickname. She called it the Temple of the Stars, and there's a big difference between a Zodiac and a Temple of the Stars. The Temple of the Stars is the entire night sky of the Northern Hemisphere, not just the Zodiac constellations. So what she was actually talking about was a star map, or a stargate, uh, and using that star map to explain different mystery traditions of the ancient world. So to kind of think, oh, it's just someone saying they see the zodiac shapes and zodiac shapes in the land. It's not that. It's more, much more complicated than that. And unraveling the things she's been talking about is a long journey because she's working with theosophists, Freemasons, antiquarians. Arthurian romance, mystery traditions from ancient Babylon, Egypt, China, and all of that gets mixed together in just understanding the night sky and the mythologies of the night sky. Uh, in recent years, she was called a uh, pioneer in arch uh, astroarchaeology, so the archaeology of the stars, if you like, the star stories. Um, <clears throat> In this talk, I'm going to whiz over lots of things. I'm not going to have time to explain them. I've got this book at the front. If you're interested in how these things were discovered and other articles, then get this book. Have a look at this book. Um, ongoing research, I'm putting together this journal, the Maltwood Journal, and it's to study all the things I'm about to talk about and other things that are connected with it. So you can pursue this after the event. Mainly today, I'm talking about Catherine's claim that the sacred landscape around Glastonbury was the temple of the British secret tradition. Um, so what is this British secret tradition? And does it exist? Did it exist? And I certainly think it did, and, and I'm going to show bits of evidence for this secret tradition of various occultists in the area and through the centuries working in Somerset and England as a whole. So mainly glimpsing the British secret tradition, something she was privy to. The main kind of zeitgeist or new age for her era was the latter years of the Victorian age. And just like in the modern new age, there was a lot of expectation about the year 2012. At the end of the Victorian age, they had their own 2012. They were wrapped up in the beginnings of the age of Michael. And this age of Michael um, was meant to kick off about 1879, 1880, 1881. Different groups of people work out the mathematics differently, but roughly you can say 1880s. And it really was quite a big thing. Um, <clears throat> and what's interesting is during the age of Michael, which lasts for over 300 years, um, we've discovered the Michael line and the Michael Triangle that I'm going to talk about and other significant lines to do with Michael and ley lines and sacred hilltops. 
Um, but the thing in itself, the age of Michael, was actually invented in 1508 by Johann Trithemius. He was a Benedictine abbey, abbot at Sponheim Abbey in Germany. And he came up with this theory of human history having different angelic eras. Um, and these were repeated three times since the beginning of time. And the reason why the Victorians got so excited about the 1880s is because it was the end of the age of Gabriel and the beginning of the age of Michael. And this age of Michael is meant to be the final age. So like I say, it was there 2012, if you like. Um, the other interesting thing with the age of Michael is Michael is meant to be governed, governing the sun and the previous age, the age of Gabriel, is that of the moon. And in the age of the moon, things are hidden and secret. So you have secret societies like Freemasonry and uh, Jesuits and other things. But at the turning point, 1880 onwards, everything's meant to be revealed. All the cards are meant to be put onto the table and things are meant to have light shown on them and things explained. Trouble is, the whole social network, primarily Freemasonry, was sworn, was men sworn to secrecy, so they can't do these revealings. So from 1880 onwards, things change, and all these mystical women step forwards, and the women aren't sworn to the same secrecy, so they can do the revealings. So 18, the age of Michael was set off in London with the erection of Cleopatra's Needle in 1878. Prince Albert himself was there when it was erected in full Masonic regalia along with all the Freemasons of London. It was a completely open Masonic uh, ceremony to initiate the beginning of the age of Michael. An obelisk is to do with the Bennu bird and the rebirth of an era and so on. Coincidentally, it's the year Catherine Motwood was born, 1878. 1880s, Madame Blavatsky um, sets up the Theosophical Society. That's begun at that beginning of age of Michael. And she's actually the first person, not Catherine Motwood, uh, Blavatsky's writings are the first reference to landscape zodiacs. It comes out of theosophy. She says that ancient priests left Egypt and traveled around the world building zodiacs. Out of theosophy came co-Freemasonry. Around about 1906, it took a little while to kick off, but Annie Besant, wherever theosophy went, she was the grand master of co-Freemasonry, men and women doing masonry together. And she held that rank for 20 years or more. This is her in a 33 degree regalia of ancient and accepted Scottish right. Um, people think there aren't female Freemasons. There are, there's about 10,000 in England. Um, same period of time, 1880s, was the beginning of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. The, Herm the Golden Dawn was set up by uh, a group called uh, Sock Ros, or the Society of Rosicrucians in England. Um, they were all master Freema Freemasons, and they set up a magical order where women and non-Freemasons can get involved and do something that's a bit more freer than Freemasonry, a, a way of exploring magic and the occult, but its origins are master Masons in the Sock Ros movement. The women of the Golden Dawn all went on to do very profound things. And in the modern new age that we have today, in many different avenues, whether it's Wicca, Druidism, still uh, theosophy, the women of the Golden Dawn were instrumental in that. Born of the age of Michael and the revealing of things that the men couldn't reveal because they were sworn to secrecy. <clears throat> Most of the women went to the Slade School of Art in London, Bloomsbury. Uh, Catherine Motwood, too, was at the Slade School of Art. Dion Fortune, local writer, member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, 1920s and 30s, so she wasn't there at the first wave, but she's the inheritor of it. Um, she's very important. Later on in the talk, 
I'll exp be explaining this triangle of Michael places, and it comes from Dion Fortune's writings. Even Chalice Well, the main founder of Chalice Well, Wesley Tudor Pole, in the 1950s wrote this booklet, Michael, Prince of Heaven, and inside it describes the Michael line and stuff. Again, the age of Michael fulfilling itself in the first 60 years from the dawn of the beginning of the age of Michael. And it's this book still sold by Chalicewell, still promoting this age of Michael concept. So, um, Catherine Maltwood, her first book, published in 1935, Glastonbury's Temple of the Stars, on the surface, it's her showing this star map or this idea that zodiac effigies, but not just zodiac effigies, other constellations like Ursa Major and Orion, which aren't zodiacal, but it's a whole star map. This is her idea of the Temple of the Stars. However, hidden in this book are many other references to things that she's spilling the beans over, which is what I'm going to show you as I go on. That was 1935, and in 1936, a year later, Dion Fortune wrote this book, The Goatfoot God. It's a novel, it's fiction, but inside the fiction, she's put a whole load of landscape geometry uh, that she and her friends were obviously working with at that time. It focuses on Avebury, but it also incorporates other places, so I'll come back to that. The point is, both Catherine Motwood and Dion Fortune part of that British secret tradition, putting things into their books. That's what I'm talking about, and the people they knew. So, Catherine's first book. In the introduction, she's quoting something about the Holy Grail, and she says the secret things of the sacrament or none to tell openly. It's kind of like in the introduction to this book, she's saying, read between the lines. There's more here than what I'm talking about. So, in that same introduction, she's talking about star law and she's talking about King Arthur, and then she says, Alfred's fort at Athelney and Camelot Castle at South Cadbury are both 11 miles from the Isle of Avalon. Then she says nothing else about it. She goes on to talk about other things. It's just a throwaway statement that didn't even relate to what she was previously talking about. Alfred's fort, we now call Burrow Mump, Okay, um, Camelot Castle is South Cadbury Castle. Um, the Isle of Avalon, she's talking about the Tor, of course, as the main focal point for Glastonbury. <clears throat> it was, that was 1935. It was the 60s before someone f took it further. If you put the compass point in the Tor here, and take the other end of the compass to the dog's nose at Borough Mump and draw a circle. It comes to another church up here called Stoke St. Michael. St. Michael Church, St. Michael Church, St. Michael Church, St. Michael Church. But once you've got three in the line, you can continue it down to St. Michael's Mount in Cornwall. We're now very aware of this line John Michelle wrote about it, uh, Paul Broadhurst, Hamish Miller wrote books about it and stuff. But this whole line from St. Michael's Mount right across the land comes from Catherine Motwood's throwaway triangle in the introduction to her first book. It's not a random thing, she knew what she was doing. Um, John Michelle himself, um, in the introduction to Paul Broadhurst's Son and the Serpent, um, says the axis of the mump is directed towards the Tor, where the line is continued by the old pilgrim path uh, to St. Michael's Tower. This line drew attention to itself and demanded further investigation, so I extended it further east and it went through Avebury. So most people think John Michel discovered the Michael line, um, and he may have, as far as his own awareness was, but as I'll show you later on, Catherine Motwood was aware of it, and Dion Fortune described the Michael line in 1936. In her book, she puts throwaway seeds. So she says, St. Michael's Tower crowns Glaston Tor, 
And many churches in the neighborhood have the same dedication, i.e. pay attention to the Michael churches. Um, Probably like this one, they stood on the site of pre-Christian fire altars. So she's thinking of fire beacons on hilltops. Uh, Elsewhere, it must have been an inspiring sight when Glastonbury Tor stood in the midst of hundreds of beacon fires, tossing their flames up to the night sky from the surrounding hills, a survival of the Beltane fires of May Day. Now, the only significance Glastonbury Tor has with May Day is the Michael line, because it points to sunrise at May Day. So she's not just saying it's a Michael hilltop, she knows it's related to Beltane and May Day, which means she must know which direction the line is aiming. She's a bit cryptic too. So here she's talking about uh, Burrow Mump, the dog's nose. And she says, on a hot May day, golden glossy king cups bloom on his sleeping eye, which look west down the nave of St. Michael's Chapel. Then a bit further on in the same paragraph, she refers to it as this St. Michael's Mount. So she's fully aware of St. Michael's Mount. And she's also talking about the Michael nave on Borough Mump, and she's saying on a hot May day, it's capital M, capital D. It's not any day in May, it's May day. Pay attention, you know? So she's actually saying hot May day, Beltane, this line down to St. Michael's Mount. So it was already there in 1935 in her books. John Michelle of Catherine says, Mrs. Malt would receive the message transmitted through time that the peculiar quality of a certain place is perceptible to men of all ages that nothing is lost. That's from his view over Atlantis. So he had respect for the lady. The pattern grows. Um, This is Catherine Motwood's triangle. And then in more recent years, I thought it was fairly recent. I thought up until recently, it was about 1990s that Nicholas Mann, a local writer, wrote about the whole diamond but um, someone I was talking to said they knew about it in the 70s, so I'm not sure how long this has been known. But what you actually have then is a Michael Church, a Michael Church, a Michael Church, and a Michael Church. Each side of the diamond is 11 miles, and just off the centre point, my thing is gone, at Ashen Cross, you've got St. Michael's Church at Somerton. Each corner of the diamond those Michael churches are 12th century. So there's something going on in the 12th and 13th centuries where the Normans are deliberately doing landscape geometry and deliberately dedicating their churches to Michael for whatever reason. And that predates um, Johann Trithemius' invention of the age of Michael. You know, that was 1508, but these Michael churches are the 1200s. The bottom part of the diamond, we're going to look down there. There's a hill called um, Ham Hill, um, and there's also a St. Michael Hill, and the church there is Stoke St. Hampton. And in the doorway, as you walk in, you've got the three fire signs of the zodiac. If you look on the far left, it actually says Sagittarius down here next to the centaur. Um, It's faded now, but it, it suggests Leo, Uh, below the lion and above him you've got uh, an agonist die but it kind of represents Aries of the zodiac too but I just want to pause here just to explain uh, the three birds in the tree as a way of appreciating how even medieval people had a much better grasp of the northern hemisphere night sky than most people today do Um, and They would have used the night sky and the mystery traditions inherited from the ancient world to explain different teachings, and I'll explain some of that later. But the three birds in the tree are part of the star map. It's not just the three fire signs. The tree itself represents the central axis up to the center point of the heavens, where currently our pole star is Polaris. And so it's the center point from which the night sky turns. That's the tree, and around the center point, three birds. Now, this is well known, but 
if it's not explained to you, you wouldn't know. If you draw that and pass it onwards, you can see in the middle here, um, Sagittarius corresponding there, Leo corresponding with the lion, and Aries. And in the middle, there's a triangle of bright stars, which astronom uh, not astronomers, uh, navigation people uh, call the summer triangle. So sailing a ship, ever since Phoenician times, they would use the summer triangle as a focal point for figuring out which direction to go. So this is old star law stuff. And the three bright stars are Altair of Aquila, the eagle, Deneb from Cygnus the swan, and Vega from Lyra. So back to this medieval church doorway, it's not just the three fire signs, it's the summer triangle above the, the polar point of the night sky. It's not just a pattern, it's not just an ornament. It's very important, and uh, the author Andrew Collins has written um, lots of stuff about the significance of Cygnus, the swan, and that's even repeated here because the star Deneb is on the center point of that line coming down. So the bird at the top of the tree is Cygnus, the swan. So just another Cygnus thing. Outside that same church, St. Michael fighting the dragon. So that's an authentic 12th century carving of the Michael dedication there. Also by this church is Montacute House. Um, it's now part of the National Trust and it's the decoration above the front door was brought up from Dorset. There was another house in Dorset and they wanted this deliberate decoration at Montacute. There's a close up, it's this diamond shape. And don't forget we're situated here at the bottom of the diamond on the Somerset parallelogram of Michael places, a close up again. Sort of thing. So, just to recap, Borough Mump, Glastonbury Tor at the top, South Cadbury on the far right, and Montacute at the bottom. So going to South Cadbury, oh no, this is Montacute still. Um, if you could just see between the trees, there's a tor, there's a hill with a tower. That's St. Michael's Hill at Montacute. And the tower is there, it's been there since the 1700s, built for astronomy by the people that live in the big manor house with a diamond. This thing um, comes from Temple Coombe in Somerset. It's just off the South Cadbury corner of the Michael diamond. Um, it wasn't found until World War II, so Catherine Motwood didn't know about it. She'd have loved to have been aware of it, I'm sure. A great story where during World War II, a woman went out to the coal bunker to get some coal and saw white stuff all amongst the black coal. And she looked up at the ceiling and the plaster had crumbled away and his face was staring down at her. Um, Temple Coombe was the preceptory of the Knights Templars in Somerset. And this painting's been carbon dated to the 1200s. Um, so it's a relic from the Templars preceptory stashed away in something that was used as a coal bunker until the World War II. The significance here is the diamond around the head. It's the same diamond that we're looking at, and each side has a hoop, um, which is very deliberate. It gives each side three sections, and the hoop, the middle bit, very important. It's an early way of looking at the zodiac, which is explained here. If you see the hoops, they bulge forwards and emphasize the four royal creatures of the zodiac. At the bottom, the yellower section where the hoop is, is Taurus the bull. Opposite Taurus the bull is Scorpio, um, often described as an eagle, as kind of Scorpio ascended as the eagle. And to the left and the right, you have um, Leo the lion, opposite Aquarius the water bearer. Now these four sections, are known as the Royal Star Cross, and that's very, very important, and I'll come back to that. But the point is, around this head at Temple Coombe, it's a zodiacal reference. <coughs> the, 
the center here of the Glastonbury Zodiac, since the 1600s, was the land of a family called the Hood family. Um, there's a famous monument in the Taurus area called the Hood Monument. And the coat of arms of the Hood family since the 1600s is this. And the center point of the diamond of Somerset is called Ashen Cross. And here you have a white cross, an Ashen Cross, going through the center point. So here's the whole pattern. From the dog's nose on the far left to Glastonbury Tor at the top, down to South Cadbury, where there's a Michael church, and not far away, the head of Temple Coombe was found. Down to the bottom, where the fire signs doorway of the church at St. Michael's Hill at Stokes of Hamden. And also in the dead center, um, St. Michael's at Somerton. This is all deliberate alignments in the land done by the Normans of the 12th and 13th century for whatever reason. It's not subjective, it's objective, it's there. And the line from St. Michael's Mount going through St. Michael places is there. Um, it doesn't prove the Glastonbury Zodiac, of course. I'm not talking about that. But what I'm talking about is Catherine Motwood, in presenting her star map, is giving you other lines across the land. She's putting things underneath between the lines. She's not alone. Uh, after we put our book together, and too late to put it in the book, we found out that William Stukeley, one of the grandfathers of modern antiquarianism, in 1724 described a sacred triangle in Somerset. This is his triangle on the right-hand side. And his triangle is Glastonbury Tor, South Cadbury, and Montacute, St. Michael's Hill. So that triangle was known about in 1724. And Catherine Maltwood, when she comes here in 1917, joins the Antiquarian Society. She's gonna be aware of Stukeley's writings, but she chooses to give us her triangle of 1935, Borough Mump, Cadbury Castle, Glastonbury Tor. But between them, they make the diamond. The diamond's broken at the bottom because some people feel it should be Ham Hill, uh, but William Stukeley said St. Michael's Hill, so there's a little gap depending on which geometry you want to go with. The church with the fire signs and the three birds is in between the two hills as well, so maybe the church is the actual place, and it is a St. Michael church. You saw the carving of St. Michael and the dragon outside. So that's a little bit from Catherine Motwood suggesting there's other things going on, giving clues to the Michael line that lead on to this Somerset diamond or parallelogram. Um, but that's not all. There's other things which were much more cryptic and took much longer to figure out. And that's what I'm gonna show you now, just a glimpse. Um, Hornblotten Church is part of the Scorpio area of the Glastonbury Zodiac or Temple of the Stars. And Hornblotten Church is a Pandora's box of symbolism, specifically relating to something called Holy Royal Arch Freemasonry. Now, if you're not a Holy Royal Arch Freemason, the symbolism's gonna pass you by. You'd go in a church and just not even notice. Catherine, being co-Mason, being female Freemason, knew the symbols. So as soon as she went into that church, she eyeballed it and recognized it for what it was if she wasn't already privy to some social scene that knew about it. So the book, the big book I mentioned goes into this in a lot of details, but I'm just gonna whiz through because I, I need to, want to show you something more fascinating to do with the whole thing and the landscape around it. Some core symbols that Freemasonry uses, um, primarily it's Old Testament stuff. It's not really Christianity as such. It's mainly obsessed with Moses, the Ten Commandments, the Ark of the Covenant, and the Temple of Solomon. It's all, it's all Old Temple Testament stuff. But the symbolisms they use are from older mystery traditions. And in the shield here in the middle, you've actually got the lion, the bull, a man, and an eagle, which is the royal star cross of Leo, Taurus, Aquarius, and Scorpio. 
that's below the Ark of the Covenant. You see that at the top, there's a the little Ark of the Covenant. So it's almost like the sacred knowledge within the Ark of the Covenant, that which is un- under it, is the royal star cross, and there is an equal armed cross there, of the heavens, of the night sky. Just to recap, Leo, Scorpio, Aquarius, Taurus. If you go away with anything today, go away with this concept of the royal star cross because it's a key to unraveling most ancient mystery sculptures, artwork, statues, stories. It's a key for astro-archaeology, and I'll show you some of that. It's just a way of measuring out the night sky and then different cultures put it into their mythology. The Royal Star Cross. So you've got the, the zodiac signs, but specifically in each sign, there's a bright star. So here at the top is Antares, is the Royal Star of Scorpio. So it's Antares opposite Aldebaran, the Royal Star of Taurus, the bull. And to the left and right, you've got Regulus, the Royal Star of Leo, opposite Fomalhaut, the royal star of Aquarius. So the royal stars are what make the cross and they're bright stars in each of those constellations. So, English Freemasonry, wrapped up and governed by the United Grand Lodge of England, still tries to keep most stuff quiet. However, the United Grand Lodge of England doesn't govern all Freemasonry. Since the 1700s, France has been independent and does what it wants, regardless of the United Grand Lodge of England. And the same too in America, since America got its independence, it says up you to the United Grand Lodge of England. And the Americans are very open about their Masonic law. So I'm able to show you things like this, not because I'm a Freemason, I'm not, um, but because in the age of Michael, everything's in the open, so to speak, and Americans are very happy and proud to show off their symbolism. So, if you go on Google Images and put Royal Arch layout, you'll find pictures like this, and they're all the same, some are better than others. But this is the key layout for doing the ritual of the Royal Arch. Now, if you look carefully at the top, in the center point, there's a white banner with a triangle, Um, That represents the Holy of Holies. But but to the left and right of it are the four heavenly creatures. On the far left, you've got the bull of Taurus, the man of Aquarius, and then on the right, you've got the lion of Leo and the eagle of Scorpio. So it's the royal star cross that's emphasized in Holy Royal Arch Freemasonry. Down each side, there's six banners, 12 in total, They say it's the 12 tribes of Israel, but symbolically the 12 tribes of Israel are the 12 signs of the zodiac. So you have a zodiac layout, and at the high altar, the emphasis of the Holy Royal Arch. What it's all around is this ornate floor of chessboard kind of patterns, and in the middle there's a circular area, and the whole ritual is played out in that kind of layout there. So here's the story. The story in the ritual that they do, that they enact, is that the tribes of Israel return from being kept prisoners in Babylon after the Babylonian Empire destroyed Solomon's temple. They took the Israelites as hostages. After a long while, they were released and they returned back to the ruins of the Temple of Solomon to rebuild and rebuild their culture. And as the story unfolds, they tap the ground and hear that the ground is hollow. And this circle in the middle of the ornate floor is special because in their mythology play, they go down through the floor to a sacred vault down below where there's secrets in the hidden vault. That's enough of that for now. Um, But this whole layout is at Hornblotten Church very deliberately. This is it acted out in a modern day lodge where they put the banners for the 12 tribes down each side. Again, 12 tribes are the zodiac signs. And you can see the four royal arch creatures at at the far distance. 
and they've got their ornate floor. Now, the ornate floor is usually a carpet. They roll out the carpet and, and then they can roll it up and put it away again. So for most of their normal lodge stuff, they use the black and white chessboard floor. But if they're doing Holy Royal Arch, they can roll out the carpet for that specific ceremony. The thing is, this carpet has to have specific dimensions. A lot of Masonic mystery is wrapped up in the mathematics of geometry. So this ornate floor should be five and a half foot by 11 foot. Inside Hornblotten Church, the main artwork emphasizes Moses, Moses striking the rock and water coming out, Moses and the tau cross, the serpent on the, the tau cross. It's all Old Testament stuff to do with Moses and the Ten Commandments. Of course, the Ten Commandments go into the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark of the Covenant goes into Solomon's Temple. So it's all about Moses, really, and Hornblot and Church is that. At the high altar, there's a big red cross, and on either side of the cross, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the bull, the lion, um, Scorpio and Aquarius. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in Christian terms, are the royal star creatures, Matthew, the four creatures, and they represent those, they're their symbols. Um, but if you look carefully here, so this, if, as you're looking at the altar, this is on the left-hand side. You'll see that Mark has his left foot on a golden box, but all of them are on this black and white Masonic floor. Um, but the left foot means truth because your heart is on the left-hand side, the left foot forwards means you're coming from truth, whereas if you've got your right foot forwards, you're not coming from truth. So you'll see that Matthew's right foot is forward, he's not coming from truth. And Mark's got his left foot on the golden box. There's a lot of story in that, too much to go into, but if you look at Mark's lower hand, the way he's holding the parchment, he's making a square. Now, you've got Matthew, Mark, Red Cross, Luke and John. If you look at Luke and John, Luke's got his left foot on a golden box and his hand's doing the compass. It's very subtle, it's very clever. Mark's got the square, Luke's got the compass. The floor at Hornblotten Church, ornate floor, six chairs on each side, which you require. You've already got the four heavenly creatures at the altar, and you need a circular, circular design in the center of the floor. Furthermore, you need it to be five and a half foot by 11 foot, and this is five and a half foot by 11 foot, and it's an ornate floor you don't have to roll out because it's permanently there. So here's another depiction of the Royal Arch layout. Top of the picture are the ruins of Solomon's temple and all the crumbling ruins to the left and the right. In the arch, you've got the triple tower in the center, the boar, the man, the lion, the eagle, and then down the side, you've got the six banners on each side, and you've got the ornate floor with a circle. But what this layout gives us is when you go down through the ornate floor, you come to the underground room where there's a light shining down and there's a double cube altar and I don't know if you can make it out, but you've got the signs of the zodiac around the double cube altar. So the point is, the mystery, the hidden mystery inside Royal Arch Freemasonry is the zodiac. The Royal Arch itself is the night sky, the dome that goes over us. Squeezing that in then, jumping ahead now to look at the wider landscape, Squishing in, I'm looking at the center line. So at the top, there's a triangle on the banner. Inside that kind of tent, the Holy of Holies, is another triangle. Then there's the ornate floor with its circle. And then under the ornate floor, there's the zodiac. This is Catherine Motwood's entire uh, Temple of the Stars layout. You actually have Hornblot and Church inside the circle, and to the left, Bruton Church and King Alfred's Tower. They all make a straight, straight line that goes right through the center of the zodiac to literally the bullseye of Taurus. 
Now this whole line, Catherine's whole Temple of the Stars is built around that. It's the equinox point, it's the central axis of the whole layout. And it's focused on Hornblot and Church. Now I'm going to just do a trick and turn it side on a little bit so that the line goes north-south. Okay. So now at the top, King Alfred's Tower, then Bruton Church, then Hornblotton Church, which is the Holy Royal Arch Church, then the center of the Glastonbury Zodiac, and Taurus the Ball, and so on. Um, so back to this layout. At the very top, the banner, the Holy of Holies, the triple tower inside the triangle, flanked by the Holy Royal Creatures, corresponds in the landscape with this place. This is King Alfred's Tower at Stourhead. King Alfred's Tower is a folly, apparently, but the whole thing of Stourhead was set up in 1717, the same year that the United Grand Lodge of England began. King Alfred's Tower is hollow. It's not rooms. You go inside and you look up to the sky and that's what you see. Okay. That radiant triangle is there in the landscape. Has been since 1760 or something or other. So it predates Catherine Mortwood. So that's the top of this diagram. That tower, that radiant triangle is there. And a straight line from that to Hornblotton Church takes you to Bruton Church. Bruton Church was built by the same people that built Stourhead. This is the high altar at Bruton Church. Blue and white, traditional Masonic colors for basic Freemasonry. But at the top, radiant triangle, okay? So back to here, the top is the tower, that is a radiant triangle. Then you have Bruton Church with the golden radiant triangle in it. And then you have Hornblotton Church with its ornate floor and a circle in the middle. Okay, they're all in a line. And then you go through the circle in the middle of Hornblotton Church and you're back into the Glastonbury Zodiac, which is the secret below. So Catherine Montwood didn't just invent a zodiacal star map. She was spilling the beans of stuff that was going on in the landscape before she moved here. Hornblot and Church predates her by about 40 years. How does she know this stuff? The very cover of her book, the writing is deliberately an equilateral triangle pointing to the center point of a circle. That's the whole layout we just looked at. It was there on her front cover for her own amusement. This line, like the Michael line, spreads across the country. Um, so I've enlarged it so you can see it, but it actually corresponds with a small area where the capital letter B is. The whole Stourhead complex is to do with Hercules. There's a temple of Hercules there. Hercules has 12 labors of Hercules. It's the sun going through 12 different signs of the zodiac. Um, and this line from this Holy Royal Arch line goes all the way to Heartland, where in Roman times it was known as the Promontory of Hercules, and it goes all the way to Canterbury Cathedral, which has medieval zodiac signs on it. This whole line you can read about in that big book. It's just a glimpse of other things. So Catherine Mulwood isn't just this Glastonbury zodiac. She's the Michael line. She's the Somerset diamond of Michael Churches. She's, she's this Holy Royal Arch Melkoff line. It's never really about 12 signs of the zodiac. It is about a star map. Here's one of her sculptures. This is at Chilton Priory. Just draw your attention to the lower part. It's like a stylized Glastonbury tour. But it's because it's stylized, it looks like an archway, okay? A royal archway with a sacred treasure inside, the chalice, okay? This is her statue for Avalon. And it looks like Glastonbury tour, but the whole mythology of the Freemasons and the Royal Arch is to dig down below, take a capstone away so that light shines in to the vault down below. So although this is Glastonbury Tour, it's also an archway with a capstone missing. And you can see down to where the radiant light is on the treasure inside or the grail inside. 
which will lead on to a little bit of star law for you. My friend Alan drew this for me very quickly because I couldn't figure out how to explain it. <clears throat> so he drew it for me very kindly. Um, on the horizontal plane is the circle of the Royal Star Cross. You can see there's an equilateral cross there. Um, further away is Antares, closer towards us is Aldebaran, that's Scorpio Taurus, the spring equinox alignment. Now the Milky Way hoops around that, pretty much coming in at Regulus for Leo and going off towards Aquarius and Fomoho. So this is a fixed thing. You have the Royal Star Cross and you have the Milky Way itself. Now, always by Regulus on the far right, the Royal Star of Leo, there's a constellation called Crater. Uh, crater is the chalice or the heavenly cup, the heavenly grail, is always related to Leo the lion. Even in Christian mythology, wherever there's a crucifixion, this is a Saxon one from England, um, but ignore the fact that it's a cruciform, think of it as a royal star cross, and if you put Leo at the bottom, as other mystery traditions do, and I'll give you an example in a minute, if you have Leo at the bottom, then you have Crater the Chalice next to it. So collecting the blood from the Messiah on the cross, the constellation of the Chalice is there. It's old star law. It's in Mithraic things. Here's a Mithraic picture. This is Mithras uh, slaught, making a sacrificial slaughter of the bull. Above him are the arch, the heavenly arch, the royal arch of the zodiac. But below Mithras himself is a little lion, Leo, and crater the wine cup, ready to catch the blood for the sacrament. Yeah. So this heavenly chalice with Leo is an old mystery school thing absorbed into Christianity, but it goes back to other cultures around the world because it's just fixed star law. Leo um, governs the heart. Different zodiac signs represent different parts of the body. So like Aries is the head and Pisces is the feet. Uh, the genitals are Scorpio. Leo, the lion, is the heart. And on this figure with the zodiac all around, you can see on his chest, there's a lion's head. It's acknowledging this Leo governing the heart thing. But if Leo is there, so also is the grail. So the heavenly chalice or the grail is in your heart. It's there with your Leo. It can't be anywhere else. Catherine Maltwood's own sculpture, she did this sculpture and she called it the Holy Grail. And she's fully aware that Leo is the heart and stuff. And she's saying the Holy Grail is the constellation that's within you. Even in Chalice Well, the lid of Chalice Well, designed by Frederick Bly Bond, is so deliberately done so that Leo and Crater are in the south when the lid is closed and the Chalice Well waters flow south towards Leo and Crater. This was in a newspaper in 1919, the, the year that Bly Bond designed the Vesica Pisces. Bly Bond was a friend of Catherine Mortwood and Dion Fortune. It's Bly Bond. He was famous for talking to the dead ghosts, uh, the dead monks of Glastonbury Abbey to do his archaeology there, but he was a mystic, occultist, Freemason, all the rest of it. He designed the famous Vesica Pisces well lid for Chalice Well, but before that, this was the design. This illustration comes from 1918. It was for a book of poems by Alice Buckton, who um, looked after Chalice Well at the time. Now, if you look very carefully, behind the figure, there's the zodiac signs in the circle. At the very top is Leo, but the lid is open. If the, if the lid shuts, then Leo is down with crater down for the flowing of the blood or the water into the heavenly chalice. Um, on the woman's chest is Aquarius because we're coming into the age of Aquarius. So this was very nearly the chalice well, well headline, uh, well lid design. And then the next year, Bly Bond did the famous Vesica Pisces, which they still use. Um, the point is, here you've got a zodiac around a well and Alice Buckton talking about Chalice Well being the Aquarian Well in 1918. Catherine Maltwood didn't say 
Glastonbury was Aquarius with a zodiac until 1935. So the idea that Catherine Mottwood invented this stuff, no, she's part of this British secret tradition that Alice Buckton, Frederick Bly Bond, Dion Fortune and other people were working with. They were already working with the heavens or the stars on the ground. Now, in 1936, the year after Catherine Mottwood did her first book, Dion Fortune wrote a novel called The Goatfoot God. And in that novel, she talks about power lines and places of power. And she gives us this in 1936. She talks about the Triangle of Michael, which is St. Michael's Mount in Cornwall, Glastonbury Tor, and Mont Saint-Michel on the border between Brittany and Normandy. Um, she goes into quite a bit of detail about the significance of this Triangle of Michael. But of course, one side of it is Glastonbury Tor to St. Michael's Mount. That's our John Michel Michael line. It was already described in the Goatfoot God in 1936. St. Michael's Mount through Glastonbury, through Avebury, is written about in The Sun and the Serpent by Paul Broadhurst, Hamish Miller. The other line from St. Michael's Mount to Mont Saint-Michel is in their second book, The Dance of the Dragon. It actually goes up to Skellig Michael in Ireland, which was famous last year because it's where Luke Skywalker was waiting at the end of the Star Wars film, it was of Skellig Michael on that Michael line. And that one goes right down through Mont Saint-Michel to Italy and, and onwards. The, the whole Michael cult with the Benedictine order begins in Italy. I'll talk about that tomorrow. But there's a, a third line. So St. Michael's Mount to Glastonbury is on Michael line. St. Michael's Mount to Mont Saint-Michel is the Apollo axis line. But there's also Mont Saint-Michel through Glastonbury and what that line does. And I'm only aware of it since last year. And I was just talking to Sean earlier and he's already aware of it but come to it from a different way of research and he calls it the Excalibur line but it's the same line basically it goes from Mont Saint-Michel to Glastonbury, goes through Portland um, through Maiden Castle Glastonbury Tour, Caer Leon Lake Barla, kisses the Isle of Man and finishes at Calanish on the Isle of Lewis so all three sides of this triangle do significant things and go to significant places, and Dion Fortune knew about it in 1936. She also describes this. There's an upside-down cross, if you look at the map. In the far north is Lindisfarne. In the far south is St. Alban's Head. In the west is Tintagel, and in the east is St. Alban's. So you've got St. Alban's Head and St. Alban's and then Tintagel and Lindisfarne. And she draws a cross with this, and they cross at Avebury. And in her book, The Goatfoot God, she says all the main power sites go to Avebury, and Avebury is the hub of all the things. So here, from her one book, The Goatfoot God, you've got the Michael line and her Lindisfarne St. Albans headline meeting at Avebury. But this Lindisfarne line that comes down through Avebury to St. Albans head, also goes right into the heart of the island of Jersey inside the triangle. I had the good fortune of visiting Jersey a lot last year. I uh, have a girlfriend who came, lived there, she now lives here, but it gave me a chance to look around and visit lots of the sites. After spending so long looking at the Triangle of Michael, it was great to get inside it. In their library, they're quite open about their Freemasonry. I found this book, but interestingly, on the back cover is the map of Jersey, and they're emphasizing the center point between the compass. Of course, I'm now aware that Dion Fortune's line goes to the very heart of this island. On their money, this is a Jersey five pound note. In the top right hand corner, you can see the island and a circle at the dead center, and energy radiating out from the center point. Now, that's Dion Fortune's Lindisfarne Avebury say Alban's headline and stuff. And I'll be talking about that tomorrow. Thank you.